Now, I must tell you, must tell you of a small child who was cycling round a block of buildings and he came round the first time without his hands on the handlebars and he said, Look, Mum, no hands! <laughs> the second time he came round without any hands on the handlebars, without any feet on the pedals, and he said, Look, Mum, no feet! <laughs> the third time he came round, he said, Look, Mum, no tea! <laughs> We present Laughter in the Air, the story of radio comedy introduced by Dickie Henderson. This week, ladies and gentlemen, Music Hall. Odd ode number one coming up, pin back your lug holes. Each day and night would Jessie Jet twiddle with her wireless set. And she did so on the very morn on which her son and heir was born. She cried on seeing him his gob. It's like a wireless thing of me, Bob. <laughs> the doctor, scratching his bald pate, said the child's about to oscillate. And if you press his little snout, the news from London will blurt out. And you won't be far wrong, you betcha, if you call that fella Cyril Fletcher. One of the many breezes from the seaside that blew a gust of fresh air into our six-valve superheads in the 1930s. With the cat's whisker gone with the twenties, it was all down to polished walnut cabinets, illuminated dials. We had one that was like fretwork with knobs on. Wireless had now become a part of the family furniture. 1932 was the year of the big move, when the BBC, now a corporation, not a company, said good night to Savoy Hill and good evening to Broadcasting House. Radio had grown rapidly in the ten years between, from crystal set to superhead, from headphones to loudspeakers, but four million listeners still had to lug their accumulators round to the radio shop to be topped up. And you had to get it in early on a Friday morning if you weren't going to miss this on a Saturday night. This is the national program. Ladies and gentlemen, Music Hall. And just listen to this lineup. Those taking part are Arthur Askey in Soothing Buffoonery, Les Allen and Kitty Masters, the radio idols, with their pianists, Laurie Day and Jimmy Turnbull, Rupert Hazel and Elsie Day in Harmony Larity, Leslie Hatton, the air craftsman, Billy Cotton and his band, Britain's master of comedy, Will Hay and his scholars, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Charles Shadwell, who will begin, as usual, with our signature tune, The Spice of Life. <laughs> Arthur Askey and soothing buffoonery. How do you soothe a buffoon? I wonder what his signature tune was before he became Big Hearted Arthur. Hello, everybody. That's the only bit I know without looking at my words. Oh, uh, good evening, Ben. What about my signature tune? Oh, good old Brahms. <laughs> Do you know, I asked a chap the other day if he liked Brahms, and he said he preferred shrimps. Hmm. I didn't laugh either. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Shadwell, does your band play anything by request? Oh, yes, rather. Ask them to play poker while I'm on, will you? Thank you. Nice fellow, Charles, aren't you, Charles? You know, uh, Mr. Shadwell and I studied together in Paris, didn't we, Charles? Yes, not the same subject. Not the same subject. No, you're quite right there. <laughs> <laughs> He's cracking me gags for me. But now... <laughs> Lovely Charlie Shadwell. He wasn't just the conductor of the BBC Variety Orchestra. He was everybody's stooge. Charlie's laugh was a legend. People listened for it with as much concentration as they listened for an SOS message or the fat stock prices. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right. Yes, indeed. Uh, in fact, that uh, brings me to, uh, to, to the fact that on one occasion, uh, talking of my laugh... Uh, when you remember Gilly Potter of, of Hogs Norton fame, his particular sense of humour particularly appealed to me. And uh, on this occasion, I, I was sitting in the, in, the, in the orchestra pit 
um, on, on music hall and, and, and waiting to play the final tune. And uh, therefore I had nothing to do except to sit there. And I, was, I really was laughing because he was so particularly funny this particular night. And Gilly suddenly looked down at me, at, at me in, the, in the pit of the auction. He said, Charles, do you mind standing up and showing yourself? He said, uh, otherwise they might think that you're some contraption or other I'm working with my foot. And before we leave that 1936 music hall, the oldest one in the BBC archives, remember this husband and wife double act? Here are Rupert Hazel and Elsie Day in Harmony Larity. <laughs> While you can, you're a long time dead. Hello, people. Everybody happy. That's the idea. Good evening, clients. That ends the relay by the Quarrel Society. And we are now back in the Giggle Factory. The Giggle Factory. Not a bad name for the BBC's brand new variety department. The chap in charge is the ex-editor of Radio Times. A spare time songwriter called Eric Mashwitz. And under his inspired leadership, the variety department soon outgrew the big new broadcasting house and moved to its own premises, that former palace of masculine's magical mysteries, St. George's Hall. And with six million licensed listeners paying ten shillings a year, the BBC could afford it. Where is the money? Where is the money? We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. Where is the money? The guy's money. Oh, man, the pressure you are through, you've done us wrong. We never see a headline about a bread line today. And when we can have a lot of we can look that guy right in the eye. Where is the money? Come on, the money. Let it ready, let it ready, let it roll in. Tricks doing a marvelous dance with a hat and cane. <laughs> of course, it's a regular stage show. On the least like a broadcast from a studio. Footlights, drop scenes, bands dressed in white flannels with brown jackets. Oh, I wish you could see the somersaults without touching the ground. <laughs> And that was Christopher Stone, the first BBC disc jockey, describing him. Soon, Music Hall, the most popular show on the radio, expanded to even greater heights. John Sharman, the producer, was determined to recreate a night out at the Music Hall in our own front parlours. Why am I dressed in these beautiful clothes? What is the matter with me? I've been a bridesmaid for 22 brides. This Twenty-three Twenty-two made on I've held off the shelf No doubt it seems a bit strange Being the bridesmaid is no good for me And I think I could do with a change Why am I always alive? Never the Lily Morris, topping the bill in her elastic-sided boots at a special music hall show broadcast from a brand new annual radio exhibition from Olympia called... Are you ready for this? Radio Olympia. And in 1933, this familiar funny man celebrated his 10th anniversary on the air. I am now flashing my electric studs, uh, red, amber and green, from my stainless steel shirt blunt as I'm the first pedestrian to be fitted with automatic lights under the new road traffic act. Of course, I have a car, a little baby five. It used to be a baby seven. But when the Prime Minister 
Right Honourable Dot J. Ramsey Ditto Hyphen Obama MacDonald. <laughs> Call on the country to economise. I had to file off the back cylinder to cut down the overhead expenses. All topical stuff. Just what you'd expect from Stainless Stephen. And here's how he sang himself off. Semicolon, dot, dot, dot. Well, let's sing a song about Great Britain. Uh, listen to what I say, come Under the flag uh, that we are proud to hang. Strange things happen every day. Scott's whiskey must be getting back to pre-war strength, I guess. As a monster sea serpent is reported in Loch Ness. For me to go and catch it, they've sent an SOS from the land of hope and glory. <laughs> Let's sing a song about old England. Our flag is the Union Jack and the Indescant. We stop milling ships, there's not a fun out slip. The cold trade to its deepest like joke. That you've enjoyed my singing is my sincerest hope. The producer has just whispered, I want something for my throat. When I asked him what he said, the best thing for it is a rope. In this land of hope and glory. Very few people knew that Stainless Stephen's real name was Arthur Clifford. But everybody knew Gert and Daisy's real names were Elsie and Doris Walters. Here they are telling you what it felt like to be offered a broadcast back in those musical days. Miss Waters, could you and your sister broadcast, if you're free, in vaudeville, eight minutes, on October the 5th for me? We mustn't inconvenience you. You're busy, we expect. But we'd simply adore to have you. What? Oh, well, words to that effect. We say we'd be delighted. Thank you very much. But they say no, thank you. We say thank you. <laughs> oh, no, thank you, they say. We thank each other once again. And, and Gert says with a laugh, <laughs> what another base in the board, Bill. And Daisy says, not half. We'd, we'd made several records, and we made one side of a thing. I remember it was called At the Court of Good Queen Bess. And um, we, we'd, we was due to make another side one Saturday morning, and we'd clean forgotten all about it. And on the Friday, we'd been doing these Masonic things, and... We got home and we said, good gracious, we've got that recording tomorrow. Never occurred to us to ring up and say we can't come and did that kind of thing. What should we do? we better do something. Well, we haven't got a, we haven't written a song. Well, we'll do a talking record for a change. Let's do two cockney women watching a wedding. People like weddings. And so Doris sat down at the piano and wrote a little, little tune and I put some words to it and it went... The wedding bells, wedding bells, they all seem so happy and gay. But when twelve months are gone, will they sing this sweet song? Many happy returns of the day. And that was the start of wedding bells. We did the wedding bells through, we recorded it, we forgot all about it. And ten days later, Mr. Price, the recording manager, telephoned us and said, you've struck oil. And we said, oh, yes, what are you talking about? And he said, that record you made. We, he said, the one about the wedding. Oh, oh, is it all right? He said, yes, it's all right. Well, we, when we did the record, it was what you'd call them. And so Doris said, well, I'll call you Gert because I like saying it. And I said, well, I'll call you Daisy. There's always a Daisy amongst them. Gert and Daisy were no crude Cockney caricatures. They were real people. As real as your next-door neighbour or the couple in the fish queue. And their men, Bert and Wally, were just as real, even if their voices were never heard on the air. And when the war came, they all did their bit. There's one thing about it, Daisy. The boys have fed jolly well in the... Yeah. But Bert still has a lot of trouble. He was drinking some stew the other day out of a tin helmet. Do you mean to say he... And, uh, and uses his what? Do you mean to say he uses his tin helmet to drink out of? Not his own. He uses the blokes next to him. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't he use his own? Because it always stinks of air oil. Oh, God. <laughs> He was drinking some stew the other day out of a tin helmet, and when they got to the bottom of the Dixie, what do you think they found? Give it up. Bert's old pipe. Girl. <laughs> when the other blokes wild? Perhaps they were, but as Bert said, what a turn up for the book. Fancy finding it in the stew, just as he was going to buy another one. Yes, rather. Mm. Bert begins to think there's some truth in what the sergeant's always telling him. Oh, what's that, Daisy? You'll be far better off in the home. You'll be far better off in the home. You'll be far better off, far better off, far better off in a home. When you're brown, oh, for something you ain't done. When you're brown, oh, 
because you've lost your gun when you're round off. It's just a bit of fun, a cool chase around the barrack square. You'll be far better off in a home. You'll be far better off in a home. You'll be far better off. Gert and Daisy, everybody's good neighbours. And such was the magic of radio that millions believed these next two very grown-up ladies were just a couple of cockney kids. Short and long, long and short, but if names are best, the long ones Ethel or Revlo, and the short ones Gracie West. Went into the wrong tent. What a shock! The man inside said, "Next time, knock." Whoa! We do see light. Yes, we do see light. But we haven't got a man to call us wife. We don't pine or make us shine. Life's worth living, and we think it's fine. For nightclubs, we'd no use at all. If we have a night out, why then we call. And we had a cup of coffee at a coffee stall, and we didn't see light. Oh, we didn't see light. Yes, we didn't see light. But we haven't got a man to call us light. We don't find or make us shine. Once about the local and the girl is mine. <laughs> now and then we go astray. To an evil vice we both give way. We pick out an awesome avatar for each way. Oh, we do see light. Yes, we do see light. The long and the short of it. Ethel Revnell and Gracie West. Two double acts from the distaff side, now two from the gents. First meet Murray and Mooney. Even their relations think they're funny. This little song, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to sing... Do you know the best way to stop fish bones from sticking in your throat? I do not. Eat liver. Eat, will you kindly keep up the stage, please? Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Do you know the best way to turn out the gas without getting out of bed? I do not. Make the old woman die. Will do you it. kindly leave me alone, please? Yes. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen... Yeah. If a lamp lighter gets two pound a week for lighting lamps, if he gets it, what does he get for putting them out? Well, how should I know? A long stick with a hook. Yes, I know what he gets. Strolling along together, ladies and gentlemen. If you went into a railway station and put down a pound note and they gave you 19 and fruitless change and a little green ticket, where would you be going? Well, how should I know? What do you want to buy the ticket for? I don't want no ticket. Good. This little song strolling along together, ladies and gentlemen. My sister went into a butcher's shop and got a 14 pound joint of meat for one and a penny. One and a penny? Yes. Was it mutton? No, rotten. <laughs> I don't wish to know that. Kind live the wireless set. And now, without their phone fiddles for once, Bennett and Williams. <laughs> What a coxswain, <laughs> I can say. Uh, a little song entitled, As She Shows, So We Shall Peep. I beg you. Thank you, madam. <laughs> uh, I see you're very late. Where have you been? Ah, uh, where do I? You know who I am. No. Don't you call me William. Well, what, what is your name, then? My name's William. <laughs> <laughs> do you like this, Bill? Do you like this chicken, eh? What is it? I've lost this chicken ten times this week, Bill. Lost it ten times? Guess what we call it. No, tell me. Fina Barbatone. <laughs> I'd rather forgotten all about Fina Barbatone. Just shows you how quickly topical gays can date. And who'd have thought they'd had local radio back in the 30s? Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Radio Barnes the calling to the world. You are now listening to Sandy's own broadcasting station, broadcasting on a permanent wavelength of 3,462 and a half gasometers. We are going to give you new ideas and new faces, I mean voices. Now, by way of a change, for the next two hours, you will hear some gramophone records. We can't do that. What do you mean, we can't do that? Well, we've got no gramophones. Sierra, well, don't give the game away. Sandy Powell, the man who gave us one of our first radio catchphrases. Can you hear me, mother? <laughs> <laughs> I was doing this sketch, broadcasting it, and uh, we called it Sandy at the North Pole. I was supposed to be an explorer, broadcasting home. I said, I'd like to speak to my mother. 
she'll be in the saloon bar at the pig and whistle <laughs> tell her her son is on the air and wants to speak to her. And this line came in the sketch, Can You Hear Me, Mother? And it was brought in two or three times, but never, never meant uh, as a catchphrase. Well, halfway through the sketch, I dropped my script on the floor, and in picking it up and getting it in rotation, I repeated this. You see, I said, Can you hear me, Mother? I won't be a minute. And uh, that's how it started. Well, I forgot all about it. This is on the Saturday night. I got to Coventry on the uh, Monday morning. And the manager of the theatre, he said, uh, you'll say that tonight, won't you, Sandy? I said, say what? He said, uh, can you hear me, Mother? I, I said, why? He said, well, you said it on Saturday night on the wireless. I said, well, what about it? He said, well, everybody's saying it. So I went on the stage, said, can you hear me, Mother? And the whole audience joined in with me. Thank you, my dear friend Sandy Powell. Here is the voice of John Watt, the new director of the Variety Department, in a hookup from a real live music hall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you now from the side of the stage at the Hoban Empire, London's real music hall. This is the first of a series of fortnightly relays from this theatre. And as it's rather a long time since we've done any broadcasting from a music hall in central London, this is something of an occasion. The first house is in full swing now. Uh, Will Fife's on the stage, just making his exit for his first number. You can probably hear the music. You can also hear his applause, I expect. It was, as you probably heard, that old favourite of his, uh, I belong to Glasgow. And when he has a couple of drinks on a Saturday, Glasgow belongs to him. Now perhaps you wonder who I am, but I'll make the fight quite clear. I'm the boss upon the ship, I'm the old Scotch engineer. The ship can't sail without me, and no matter where I go, I'm a bit of a top, but I mix with the nuts, and the engine's down below. And I'm fond of the rolling sea, to hide the rolling holy sea. And if you were a sailor, you would say the same as me. And when I get ashore again, and I've had two or three, then I always have the feeling that I'm still upon the sea. I'm fond of the rolling sea. Will Fife topping the bill at the Hoban Empire in 1938. The BBC loved these live broadcasts from the London halls, mainly because in the early days, George Black banned from broadcasting the music hall stars under contract to him. Now he changed his mind. Finding that radio was creating its own stars, George Black once again threw open his theatres to the BBC microphones. Mind you, OBs, as we insiders call outside broadcasts, didn't always quite come off. Take the time Gordon Cry went down to the Little Theatre to broadcast the new review, Nine Sharp. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the only living fish mimic, Mr. Edwin Cobb. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I will now give you a demonstration of one of my most superhuman feats. I will imitate the call of the red-bellied gudgeon or blushing fish. <laughs> Uh, this call is so high in the sky <laughs> as to be completely inaudible to the human eardrum. <laughs> Dogs can hear it, however, as their eardrums are highly sensitive. And it is also audible to a Mrs. Hall, a lady friend of mine. <laughs> A lady friend of mine, who lives on the Norfolk Broads, and who has been endowed, through some caprice of Mother Nature, with the eardrums of a elk hound. <laughs> now, will you please listen carefully and watch your dog's faces? <coughs> Oh, I must insist upon a deathly ash.
Well, I do hope that sounded as funny to you as it looked to us. Uh, broadcasting fish is a rather tricky business. That wasn't an easy chore. Rather like listening to a long-playing record of Marcel Marceau's. That was Professor Edwin Karp, who changed his name to Richard Hayden and then became a Hollywood film star. But talking of outside broadcasts, here's one that made broadcasting history. Shows from the seaside. Round the Folderols, 1937. A live link-up from the Pier Pavilion Landidno. The Pier Pavilion Sandown, the White Rock Pavilion Hastings, and the Devonshire Park Eastbourne. So over to the Folderols. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Harry Pepper here on the side of the stage at Eastbourne. Before we start, I should like to tell everyone that this program is going to be very, very difficult. Last year, we had the three Folderol shows. This year, Mr Newman has saved up a few pennies during the winter and has bought himself another show at Sandown Isle of Wight. And tonight, we shall include that as well. All four companies take part in this program and all actually speak to one another. The synchronisation will be carried through by means of headphones and portable sets at the four seaside towns. The complete broadcast involves nearly a thousand miles of landline, 20 microphones, a dramatic control panel and four subsidiary ones and a very big squad of engineers. Myself and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all and a grand muster of over 68 folderols. In districts Dogger and Humber, winds north and south with local fog, snow, rain, typhoon, monsoon and pontoon. And now see if you can spot a star of the future. A clue? Pin back your lagos. There was a wicked villain once whose name was Jasper Knops. He married girls and bumped them off with poisoned acid drops. <laughs> One day he met a village maid, sweet little Audrey Green, and pressed his suit until she cried, Say, keep the party clean. That selfsame day they both were wed, and wicked Mr. Knops said, Cook my supper, or then perhaps we'll have some acid drops. The supper was a Yorkshire pie made, bli made by the blushing bride. Knops took a mouthful, then he said, Good gracious me, and died. Now little Audrey's had six husbands, and she thinks it frightfully funny, and laughs and laughs and laughs and laughs when she draws the insurance money. <laughs> yes, there was a decidedly odd odour coming from Eastbourne. I really wanted to be a straight actor. So I came, immediately I left school, I got myself a job in London, and then went in the evenings to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, where I learnt elocution, stage, etc. And it was necessary for me, as I worked for a Scottish insurance company, to earn extra money to pay for my fees. So I wrote myself a funny act composed of odd odes and, and various oddments, odd odes and oddities, one might say, and performed them at various dinners and um, Sunday concerts and things like that. Cyril dreaming of the Fletcher, as he was billed in those days. Introduced by Harry S. Pepper. Harry's dad, Will Pepper, was the originator of another, even earlier seaside concert party with the opening chorus of Come On and Listen to the Gay White Coons. Now, there's a song for Alf Garnett's album. Elsie and Doris started with the White Coons, so did Harry Pepper and Doris Arnold. And from them sprang another radio version of yet another type of traditional entertainment. The Camp Town ladies sing this song. Good on, good on. The Camp Town race back five miles long. I came down from the hat cage. I came down from the hat cage. I came down from the hat cage. Professor Bones to say a few words. Good evening. Uh, let me start my aimless chatter with a warning to those contemplating matrimony. The only way to live on love is to stay single. 
And always remember, love at first sight often means divorce at first sight. <clears throat> Because, you know, I didn't fall in love with my wife at first sight. Oh, dear, no. <laughs> when I first met her, I didn't know she had money. But uh, <clears throat> it, was, it was really quite amusing how we first became acquainted. I was sitting next to her at the pictures, and uh, as we were coming out, I said, um, I wish you'd give me your telephone number. She said, oh, uh, you'll find it in the book. I said, fine. <laughs> What's your name? She said, you'll find that in the book, too. <laughs> <laughs> the Kentucky Minstrels, written and remembered by C. Denny Warren. And that was Denny Warren himself as Professor Bones. Two other regulars were Cuthbert and Pussyfoot, played by Scott and Whaley. They could never remember anything. I want a pair of thick rim harnicles. You mean hem rings barnacles. I said rim horn spectacles. No, you said spawn rum spectacles, is I, what you said. I distinctly said rum spawn hosticles. Oh, here's a telescope. The customer is always right. Scott and Whaley, the only Kentucky minstrels who didn't have to black up for the show. And having successfully revived the old-time minstrel shows, what more natural than that radio should revive old-time music hall? Penny sobrieties, penny sobrieties. All your doors this way, stalls on the right, circle on the left. Pit and gallery, up the alleyway. Penny sobrieties, just about to commence. That's right, sir. Straight through the glass door. Ladies and gentlemen, greet your worthy chairman for tonight, Mr. Will Philpott. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. What an honor and a pleasure it is to sit here at my chairman's table and see the faces of the audience who will soon be regaled with the good fare offered by the Palace of Variety. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I said the faces, and oh, my friends, what faces? Oh, I backpedal, Governor. My face is my fortune. Well, in that case, sun kissed, consider yourself bankrupt. <laughs> now, it is my great pleasure to announce the appearance of a very famous comedian from the Emerald Isle. He will appear in one of the famous dame characters he has created in pantomime. It is indeed a feather in the cap of this management to be able to count him as our guest tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sean Glenville. Yeah. In sweet Limerick town, they say, was a chap named Patrick John Malloy. Once he sailed to USA He's looking for foreign parts He thought he'd try He made his name And he got lots of gold He put a bit away for a rainy day So if you gaze upon The house of Patrick John You'll find a note that goes on to say If you're Irish Come into the parlor There's a welcome there for you And if your name is Timothy, a fat. So long as you come from Ireland, there's a welcome on the mat. If you come from the mountains of Parnar, Killarney's lake so blue. We'll sing you a song, we'll make a fuss. Whoever you are, you want the fuss. If you're Irish, this is the place for you. Rousing stuff. A real living, breathing evocation of the Edwardian music hall, recreated with care and a good deal of love by Ernest Longstaff. When war came in 1939, the Second World War, but radio's first, it was the senior stars of the music hall who were the first to answer the call. Kate Carney in her 70s from Collins Music Hall. 
champion, old Henry VIII himself, also in his 70s. Now all the daily papers say, oh, get chin up, oh, get chin up, my old girl and all the kids, who's economy? Bought some seeds of wolves and just paid the course 3D. So far the brothers, sisters, brothers, take the tip from me. Let's all be busy, all be busy. Don't look sad and don't look glum. If you're going up, think them come. Dress up like a farmer's boy, call the Roy's and Gators. Dig up all your old red doors, grow some blooming tigers. All be busy, let's all be busy. Even Randolph Sutton abandoned Mother Kelly's doorstep. Things you used to throw away, you're empty down the drains. I wanted for munitions, now we're making aeroplanes. Look inside your whatnot, plenty rubbish you will see. If you haven't got a whatnot, look just where it used to be. Save your bits of gristle and your little bits of bread. Save your little bits of fluff from underneath the bed. Save your empty packets of your fags or anything. Save your walnut zips and tie your doings up with string. On the tops of wardrobe, there's an awful lot of junk. Father's hat for funerals and mother's bits of skunk. A look inside the tool shed and without a bit of swank you'll find enough of father's rubbish there to build a tank if morrison inside your bottom drawer could have a look blimey he would murmur what a turn up for the book hooks and eyes and air pins and buttons what a cop and wellbone that is busted up where well, wellbones ought to stop so get together all your junk and give it to the man or go for it take it out bung it in the van they'll turn it into armaments and you can say with pride the metal from your old suspenders up to turn the tide up housewives and adders of housewives and atom Save your big fur and keep your eye on Rags, bones, and the old iron Of housewives and atom Soon we'll tit for tatum Save up all your junk You gotta help to win the war And of housewives and atom In Bristol, the evacuated BBC Variety Department rolled up its collective sleeve and did its bit, too. In those dark days of blackouts and blitzes, it was being so cheerful that kept us going. That's a quote from Mitmar, and we'll be tuning into Tommy Handler's famous show next week. Meanwhile, it was Radio Music Hall that kept us cheerful. And one Saturday night, the nation heard a new voice announcing its turns. Believe it or not, it was the Right Honourable Ernest Bevin, the Minister of Labour. I don't know whether I'm... Blacklegging the announcer, or putting John Watt out of a job, or, or, or what I'm doing. But uh, uh, it's a special privilege to me now to introduce two very dear friends. And uh, friends of yours, friends of mine, Elsie and Doris Walton. <laughs> Hello, girl. How are you? <laughs> oh, follow that. <laughs> oh, aren't they lovely? They can on days, all right. Yes. Don't meet much nowadays, do we? No. Got Don't often meet during the day. No. <laughs> got something better to do. That's right. Yes. I hope we haven't. I might say sometimes I get a bit tired, you know, with making uh, shells six days out of seven. <laughs> Blimey, girl. Good job you're not a chicken then. They make shells every day. No, <laughs> 
and it was from Ernie Bevan's own suggestion that John Watt launched a whole new and very famous series of lunchtime shows. Ladies and gentlemen, Workers' Playtime! <laughs> The first programme of all, on May the 31st, 1941, came from a Royal Ordnance factory, deep in the heart of somewhere or other. Uh, Michael North, who produced the first series, uh, took down Margaret Eaves and Fred Yule, Jean de Cassilis, and Forsyth Seaman and Farrell. Like a cheerful sound, sweet music makes your wheels go round. Let a plague have a plague like the birds in the spring. In no time at all, Workers' Playtime was travelling up and down the country, sending out three shows a week, live from factory canteens, shipyards, mines, anywhere they could set up a microphone. And right there with them, the resident compere, Bill Gates. Usually, we do the show in the works canteen. A worker came to me one day and said, if you aren't good, we'll throw the food at you. This cheered me up no end, especially when I noticed they were eating curry. Another time, we had a platform in the open air right under the bows of great half-finished ships and an audience of 10,000 shipyard workers who clambered all over the ships and cranes to watch and to sing. And as if three shows a week weren't enough, in 1942 they started a midnight workers' playtime for the night shift and transmitted it to America. I wonder what the Yanks made of Billy Kay as a land girl. Left, left, I had a good job on the left to go and do me duty for England, home and beauty. Left, left, me job in the city I left and that's the song we're singing as we march along. Hitler said he'd starve us out, but that's a lot of dope. So long as they are girls like me, he hasn't got a hope. Oh, Adolf, what have you done for me? I never, never, never dreamt a land girl I should be. They dressed me up in corduroys, they handed me a rake. They taught me how to milk a cow before I'm half awake. And I know how many beans make five and when a duck's a drake. Oh, Adolf, what have you done for me? I never, never, never dreamt a man girl I should be. I never knew I looked so good dressed in me corduroys. I've made a hit with the farmers and with all the local boys. And even when I pass the ball, he makes a friendly noise. Oh, I know what have you done for me. This is Bill Gates wishing you all good luck, war workers. Bill's best memory of workers' playtime was the day Queen Mary came along and joined in the chorus of Lily of Laguna. The royal family had always taken a great interest in radio, and in 1942, on the 21st of April, to be precise, there was a royal occasion of very special interest, a radio command performance at Windsor Castle. Of course, the entire Itmar company were invited, and so was another favourite comedy team from the Howdy Folk Show, Kenway and Young. Here's Nan Kenway. We had the great privilege of performing for Princess Elizabeth's 16th birthday at Windsor Castle. I believe it was the first radio royal command that there had been. Afterwards, we all went into the drawing room and we were all presented and the king and queen and the little princesses came in and the dogs all came in. We were full of corgis as well and it was charming and it was so informal and I don't think I've ever enjoyed anything so much nor have I ever been so frightened. And here's a special scoop. Broadcast now for the very first time ever 
a recording of that private show at Windsor Castle in 1942. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, and your Royal Highnesses, Nan Kenway and Douglas Young. How do you do, Mr. Butler? Come along. Here, I left my bike outside. Will it be all right, you reckon? Oh, yes, I think your bicycle will be quite all right, Mr. Butler. Now, around this way. I won't half have so much to tell the lads back in Skittle Alley when I get home. <laughs> well, now, come along, Mr. Butler, around this way. I want you to read from the script, please. I like them. What? Split peas. <laughs> now, before we commence, I have one or two uh, telegrams for you here. Are oh, you reading, will you? I can't read. Yes, very well. Now, here we are. <laughs> Let me see now. His Majesty the King sends heartiest congratulations on your 100th birthday and hopes you will live to enjoy many more. My word. A telegram from the King. Well, gosh darn me. He don't say nothing about coming round to his tea, do he? <laughs> Very tasty. Very sweet. <laughs> Meanwhile, the home front life of barrage balloons, British restaurants and buzz bombs was being reflected by the stars of Saturday Night Music Hall. Jan de Cassilis, as Mrs. Feather, was still in trouble with her telephone. Hello? Hello, hello, exchange, supervision, operations, aberrations, hello, hello? Who is that? Engineers, you again. Don't I know what? That there's a war on. Now, look here, engineers. Look, look here. You can't go on throwing the war into my teeth. Oh, yeah, the Blitz. Throwing the Pacific down my throat next. You wish you could. Oh. I mean, can't you, can't you, can't you look at the bright side of things for once? Well, what about our victories? I mean, why shouldn't your system be affected by, by them for a change? Think of the Russians threatening the Germans in the rear. <laughs> Chasing them with gorillas. <laughs> Old timers like Leonard Henry were bang up to date with their topical quips. Oh, oh, I got the German news in English. Oh, oh, Field Marshal Goering's been knighted. And who do you think did it? Mr. Schickelgruber did it. He took a sword, he held it over Slap Happy Herman's head, and he said, Arise, circumference. <laughs> Izzy Bond, Builders Radio's own Hebrew comedian, brought the house down if not the Anderson Shelter, with up-to-date routines like this. It appears that John Bull, an old nasty puss, you know, the rat with the little moustache, were playing a, a game of poker. John Bull said to Hitler, what have you got? Hitler said, I got Denmark, Romania, Bulgaria, and Belgium. That's four kings. John Bull said, what's your other card? Hitler said, a juice running away. I mean, wild. <laughs> <laughs> A John Bull said, I'll tell you what I got. I got an Air Force. That's an ace. I got a Grand King and Queen. I got a Jack Carr and 10 Downing Street. That's Ace, King, Queen, Jack, 10. And they're all through blue. Uncle Sam was standing by. He said, why, John? That's a top straight flush. That's unbeatable. Hitler said, the U.S., why don't you take a hand? Uncle Sam said, at least said, soonest lend it. <laughs> I'll spare you his rendering of when the light's gone again. Now, you remember Leslie Cerrone from last week? Well, he joined Leslie Holmes, the smiling voice of radio. And as the two Leslies, they cheered us all up with this topical ditty. That moustache you got won't save you When the Jewish barber shave you Old man shickle grubber, what are you going to do? Oh, old man shickle grubber, you're going to lose the rubber Your doom's coming, you know that it's true Old man shickle grubber, we're going to make you blubber You've got something that's coming to you You'll pop off with your new order A it in yourself to the border Old oh, man, shickle grubber What are you going to do? Oh, tell me what you're going to do For those younger listeners who may still be with us Old man shickle grubber was also known as Adolf Hitler And dear old teeth and trousers, Norman Long Predicted what a time we would all have when Not if victory came high and low good
great and small, we'll all be dancing at the victory ball. All be making whoopee, trying to relax, never caring tuppence for your income tax. Teddy Brown is coming with an act you will admire. You do an acrobatic stunt, dancing on the wire. And Vera Lynn will want to set the world on fire on the night of the victory ball. High and low, great and small, we'll all be dancing at the victory ball. Shouting out a chorus, jigging up and down, Richard Tauber singing Knees Up Mother Brown. <laughs> BBC announcers, though it's rather strange, will all be coming so they're trying to arrange for dear old Stuart Hibbard to say blimey for a change. <laughs> On the night of the victory ball, high and low, great and small, we'll all be dancing at the victory ball. Then suddenly... One Sunday. Welcome to Variety Bandbox. How do you do, everybody? This is Philip Slesser speaking from the stage of the Cambridge Theatre, London, presenting the people of variety to a variety of people. Supporting the artist today, we have, as usual, Billy Turnant's orchestra with the maestro himself, Billy Turnant. Variety Bandbox, a bright, breezy show based on the tried-and-true musical formula. The showcase for the new talent that had emerged from the ranks of the service shows. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> now, how to be a singer, how to be a singer by Francis Howard. Copyright, reser copyright reversed. Preserved, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I must, I must remember to keep my eyes open when I'm reading. Now, um, now, look, listen, don't mess about. Now, some of you, okay, now, listen, some of you have got the idea that you can't sing, haven't you? And I say to this, I say, this beautiful tripe. Derek Roy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now look. Cease. Frankie Howard, kicking off the most famous feud in radio with Bambox's other resident comedian, Derek Roy. I've got the sun in the morning and the sad. Oh, hello, you're awake. You look a little rough, huh? Annie, is it really you? Why did you run away to this desolate place? Well, I, I always wanted to go out west where men are. Uh... Where men are what? Nothing, just where men are. <laughs> Annie, is it true you rustle? Only when I wear my utility underwear. No, no. <laughs> no, no. I mean, all that cattle you stole. Why don't you give up them steers? At last. What words do you mean, Annie? You know, get up them stairs! Dr. Roy the Melody Boy. Then out of the bandbox came... Confidentially, I like to talk confidentially with folks like you. Confidentially, I'll tell you this. My Penelope. <laughs> you know, she used to call me her little lovebird. I'd just begun to molt at the time. I, rem I remember the night I accepted her. She looked down at me and she breathed heavy. I didn't know if it was passion or pneumonia. And she says, you know, you do something to me, Reggie. You do something to me. I said, you're doing something to me too, Penelope. She says, what? What am I doing? I says, you've got your brooch caught in me ear all. <laughs> I 
felt poorly. <laughs> I felt proper poorly. Reg Dixon, of course. And the cat, the lot, the prince of the wide boys himself. Hang on a minute, Willie, the producer wants me. I'll just go... <laughs> Hey, I thought I'd got a sack for a minute. <laughs> now, there's a complaint. There's somebody in the circle eating peanuts and throwing the shells into the stalls. Now, it's got to stop. Now, well, there's a bald-headed man in the stalls. He said, would you mind washing him apart a bit? He's getting a blooming lot. <laughs> you don't mind that, do you? <laughs> yes? You want to think yourself lucky coconuts are short? <laughs> Anyway, I've got to go now because they're all coming down the other side here and I've got about 15 of them. You get a pinch of salt and you can put it in and you stir it up sufficiently strong to get the safety curtain clear the time and the time because I'm putting the money in. I'm not arguing because Audrey's got this cake. She falls in it. We call it Audrey cake. Well, you're all stirring it up. You see. You're trying to... Oh, it's very difficult because I've got it on the end of my finger. Look, I've got to walk down the underground like that and they're all going up and down like this and you're throwing these things and you're coming down the other side. I'm not looking at this because I don't know what I'm talking about. But this other... I don't, well, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Play the music. Open the cage. All for English. Powdering our faces with sunshine. Music hall, variety playhouse, whatever the name, the show's the same. Top of the bill turns in your own home with the flick of a switch. Next week, Bandwagon and Itmar. This week, let Charlie Shadwa sign off our show as he always did long years ago. <laughs> Laughter in the Air was introduced by Dickie Henderson, written by Dennis Gifford, and produced by Bobby J. In next week's programme, Dickie Henderson takes a look at Arthur Askey's bandwagon and how it came to be such a huge success.